the main objective of this talk is try to present you our portable DNA sequencing activities that have been used to impact the response to emerging and re-emerging viral pathogens on the ground, mainly in Brazil. Uh, well, uh, actually, those activities start in 2016 uh, when Brazil, as well as the America, experienced the emergence of this new treat of international concern, the Zika virus. So at that time, actually, in collaboration with uh, national as well as uh, international institutions, we start to uh, realize this kind of project that was called ZEBRA, uh, which an acronym uh, uh, means uh, Zika and Brazil real-time analysis. Uh, so um, to do so, we aim to uh, generate a huge amount of genomic data by implementing for the first time the use of the nanopore sequencing in Brazil and in the Americas. But why actually we were really interested to obtain complete genome sequence? Because actually we already know that of course full end genomes contain higher resolution compared to partial sequence. So for example, in the case of Zika, um, the screening of complete genome sequence um, was really challenging, for example, to try to identify possible mutations that could uh, maybe explain the differential clinical outcomes in some patients, including, for example, microcephaly. Uh, so, uh, as I said, we actually uh, use and implement for the first time uh, the use of the nanopore sequencing. So, uh, the name nanopore, so it's actually this really small uh, uh, portable sequencing that has been developed by the Oxford Nanopore Technologies. And actually, the name uh, is due to the presence uh, of the nanopores, which are like uh, transmembrane protein uh, from coli. So, they are specific for DNA. Uh, the kind of uh, sequencing is like 1D, so this means that uh, it's not possible like, to sequence also the, um, the, other, uh, the other strand. And the kind of detection is disruption in electrical current. So this means that uh, each base uh, is able to, uh, to, uh, to um, I can say, like, uh, uh, to estimate uh, a specific disruption in electrical content in electrical content that is actually um, recognized by the, a sensor and is converted by uh, the specific base. So um, to do so, we actually were also involved in the, uh, so we used to combine actually genomic uh, data uh, with bioinformatics tool, as well as uh, uh, we try to combine all of those information also with epidemiological data. And we were also involved in the, in the uh, development of this kind of tool that, uh, that is called Primal Scheme uh, in collaboration with the University of Birmingham. So uh, that gave us the possibility to obtain in a, few minutes like uh, the multiplex primal scheme uh, that gave us the possibility to amplify the entire coding region of the Zika virus at that time. So the only input we need is like uh, a FASTA file from the uh, viral pathogen that we are looking for. And uh, the, the, the tool is able to generate these uh, multiplex uh, with overlapping uh, primers uh, that is able uh, as I said, uh, to amplify the entire, the entire coding region. Uh, so this is actually the workflow that we are using. So of course, uh, uh, all of our experiments are based on the PCR screening for RT-PCR. So we actually select sequences, uh, we select sample for the genome sequencing based on the CT value, uh, which need to be below 32 at least. So after this, we proceed with the multiplex PCR using the primer scheme that we have generated. And then of course, quantification, quality control, as well as the library preparation sequencing analysis pipeline and quality control. Uh, as I said, they actually, we, uh, in 2016, uh, Brazil experienced uh, um, the, the emergence of this new treat of international co content, which is the Zika virus. Uh, and actually, uh, the, the first um, autochthonous cases were reported in March, April 2015, so between 2015 and 2016. So at the time, we start to realize this kind of genomic surveillance activities, um, and we uh, obtain uh, uh, the first complete genome sequence from Salvador Bahia and later we also in collaboration with the University
city of Birmingham try to uh, we try to explain uh, the uh, I can say like the uh, the initial step of the Zika virus in the Americas. So we dated back the introduction event of Zika virus in the Americas in 2014. So at the time we try to combine also uh, genomic as well as uh, epidemiological data to try to see if there were some uh, some events that may be uh, able to uh, explain this um, introduction, the introduction of this novel uh, viral pathogen in Brazil. So we realized that two kind of uh, um, of events, uh, which were the World Cup uh, as well as the World Confederation Cup, may also be related to the introduction of this novel lineage of these novel uh, viruses in Brazil and the Americas due to globalization, global mobility, of course. Um, so uh, February 1st, 2016, actually, the WSU declared state of emergency of international concern uh, due to the uh, exponential number of notified cases of microcephaly. Uh, so at the time, we also had the opportunity to uh, characterize one case uh, of, uh, uh, so we were able like, to uh, detect Zika virus in different body fluids of a newborn with several outcomes, uh, including also the microcephaly as well as uh, the uh, amniotic band syndrome. Um, but actually, the main point was, uh, what about the underlying mechanism? So we realized that, that for 100,000 notified cases, we have uh, a really uh, paucity of complete genome sequence from Zika virus that uh, were like, uh, um, so uh, this is why actually we decide to perform this kind of genomic surveillance activity in the context of the Zebra project. So it was a, a really uh, road trip. So actually it was uh, an itinerant uh, project uh, in, uh, in Brazil. So we use uh, a mobile lab to screen all the uh, positive sample already collected in the central laboratory of health, uh, which are located in each federal state in Brazil. Uh, so, and during uh, 15 uh, days, uh, we uh, test more than 1,400 clinical samples, and we capture also uh, around 800 uh, mosquitoes. Um, but why we actually uh, decide to choose uh, the Northeast region? Because of course we know that uh, uh, at the time was the uh, the region that was more eaten by the epidemic, and also because uh, was the region that reported as well the majority number of cases of microcephaly. Um, so uh, during those activities, we were actually able to obtain 54 complete genome sequence from Zika virus during this uh, mission road trip uh, in Northeast Brazil. And we combined genomic and epidemiological data to try to uh, describe uh, the, uh, the epidemic in Brazil and the Americas. So using phylogeographic approach, we were able to estimate, for example, that the Northeast Brazil, highlighted by uh, this blue clade uh, from Bahia, uh, may have Act like such an interesting role uh, for the initial spread of the Zika virus. Uh, so, since its uh, first detection introduction into Bahia, the virus was spreading in the other federal Brazilian states as well as uh, in other American countries. Uh, well, actually, we dated back also uh, the introduction event of Zika virus uh, in 2014, and we decide to call this kind of transmission a cryptic one uh, because we know that the uh, first autochthonous cases were detected just in March, April 2015. So we really don't know what happened during this time. So we imagine that maybe this uh, could be due by uh, misclassification due to the co-circulation of other arboviruses already endemic in Brazil, uh, such as yellow fever as well as dengue. Uh, then uh, due to due, uh, the uh, the, the success in the use of this technology, we also decide to extend this technology to try to follow the path and the spread of other arboviruses circulating, co-circulating Brazil, as well as to try to understand, for example, uh, the path of dispersion of these viruses in other Brazilian regions. So we, uh, in collaboration with a few cruise Amazonas, uh, we realized this genomic surveillance uh, in North Brazil. So we described first uh, the, uh, the uh, dispersion event of of Zika virus, so we found the evidence of multiple in, uh, independent introduction events, and we, uh, we found the evidence of uh, a really huge sustained transmission highlighted by these red clades. So we decided to try to understand better 
uh, what happened in the city of Manaus, um, and we realized for these uh, these phylogeographic analysis to try to um, so actually we divide the, the Manaus city in different areas and regions, which are the north, the east, the west one, and the south one. So we found evidence that the north part of Manaus uh, of Manaus uh, has played such an interesting role. And it was able to uh, like to mitigate the dispersion of the virus uh, among the city. Then, uh, as I said, that we were also uh, interested to try to understand uh, the dispersion event of other arboviruses uh, that are actually currently circulating, co-circulating Brazil, among them the chikungunya virus that is also considering a, a new emerging one. So we know that the first cases of autochthonous transmission of chikungunya virus in Brazil were detected in, uh, in uh, mid-2014, uh, when Brazil experienced the co-circulation to distinct lineage, actually uh, the genotype, the Asian genotype, which was endemic just uh, in the north part of the country, in Oyapok uh, um, city, in the Amapa states, and then uh, the ACSA, the African one, uh, which was discovered for the first time uh, in the uh, city of Feira de Santana, which is located in Bahia states, uh, northeast Brazil. Well, um, uh, in collaboration again with the uh, few cruise Amazonas, we actually were able to uh, detect for the first time uh, the circulation of the African genotypes also in North Brazil, highlighting the importance to realize this kind of genomic surveillance activities like uh, in, uh, in real time. Um, then, uh, as I told to you, the, uh, the emergence of the African genotypes uh, in Brazil was detected in Bahia states, uh, and among 2018-2019, actually, uh, Bahia uh, experienced another huge outbreak of chikungunya virus, so we described the return of the founder chikungunya virus to its place of introduction into the states of Bahia. So, actually, we, uh, we uh, found the evidence of some persistence uh, as well as reintroduction action events uh, mediated by other Brazilian regions, for example, in this case, by the southeast uh, region of Brazil, Rio de Janeiro, highlighting the, the complex dynamics of dispersion of these arboviruses in the country. Um, again, uh, later, uh, actually, in, uh, by the end of 2016 and the beginning of 2017, uh, uh, actually, Brazil was struggled by a huge outbreak of uh, yellow fever uh, that had been detected for the first time uh, in the Minas Gerais state, which is located in southeast Brazil. So at that time, we decided also to extend those activities to try to characterize uh, quickly the source of this outbreak uh, and uh, in collaboration with the uh, Ezekiel uh, Gias Foundation, which is uh, the uh, main uh, public health institute uh, located in Minas Gerais states, we uh, realized this kind of genomic surveillance activities also to try to characterize the yellow fever virus epidemic. So actually, this kind of epidemic uh, was considered one of the main uh, outbreak never, uh, never reported before, which was able also to uh, achieve uh, areas that present a really low vaccination coverage. Uh, so in one week, uh, we were able to uh, generate 77 complete genome sequence from uh, uh, the Minas Gerais outbreak. So we detect the circulation of the South American genotype 1, and we were able also uh, characterizing by complete genome sequence to detect some mutations that were really specific of the 2016-2017 outbreak. Most of them were located in NS5 protein, which is also the poly Race. Um, uh, then, as I said, uh, we try to combine uh, genomic as well as epidemiological information to try to describe the dispersion of the yellow fever virus since its first detection in Minas Gerais and this dispersion in the other uh, states, uh, which are uh, Espirito Santo, Rio de Janeiro, São Paulo, and then Bahia. Um, so uh, the analysis of those data gave us the possibility to understand that several long distance movement suggested that the yellow fever virus dispersion was mediated by humans. Uh, and, uh, and then, uh, in collaboration with uh, the, our, uh, our lab, which is the reference lab of flaviviruses uh, in the Osvaldo Cruz Foundation, uh, we also characterize, up to now, we were able to generate more than uh, 1,000 complete genome sequence from uh, yellow fever from 
several Brazilian states, including some located in Southeast, among them Minas Gerais, Espírito Santo, Rio de Janeiro, as well as uh, Northeast states, Bahia One, and then also Sao Paulo. So the analysis of those genomes gave us the possibility to identify among the South American one lineage the presence of two distinct West South lineage that we call lineage one and lineage two. So lineage one just include the sequence from northeast of Minas Gerais, uh, which were able to um, uh, to uh, guarantee like the dispersion of the yellow fever in other Brazilian states, including Espírito Santo, Rio de Janeiro, as well as Bahia. And we found the evidence that lineage two just includes sequence from the south of Minas Gerais that mediated the, the introduction in Sao Paulo. So in Sao Paulo, we see like uh, just one introduction event uh, alighting by this well-structured monophyletic claim. Um, then uh, in 2019, actually, uh, we know in Brazil there is uh, the circulation, co circulation of multiple really uh, arboviruses. Actually, uh, Brazil experienced one huge outbreak of dengue virus. So in 2019, there were like the co circulation dengue one and dengue two. And we decided uh, with, uh, with Luis, which is the coordinator of all those activities, to realize uh, like a combined strategy focus on a mobile lab using a motor room uh, that was traveling in Midwest Brazil, as well as uh, a training course, uh, which was uh, uh, realizing in uh, Belo Horizonte, uh, which is the capital city of the Minas Gerais states. So uh, we generate 20, 20, uh, 227 complete genome sequence from dengue one and dengue two, from those two activities. And uh, this actually is the, the uh, I can say like the, uh, the the workflow that we generally use. And uh, uh, so actually those are some of our results. Um, here uh, I just highlighted the, the, um, the Brazilian region from which we generated genomes. Uh, here we, there are like the time series from uh, uh, dengue virus incidence cases from 2015 uh, uh, up to 2020. And here we just highlighted the, the uh, region from which we generated genomes, right? So we plot the number of the incidence of number of cases notified as well as we also plot the index P, which means the reproductive number of the vector, the Aedes aegypti, uh, which is responsible to uh, of the dengue virus transmission. And then in pink, we just plot the number of genomes that we have generated. So those are the results from uh, the characterization of dengue one genotype five. So we found the evidence of the co-circulation three distinct clade among the dengue one genotype five. Uh, and uh, those are the results from the dengue two. So actually uh, we obtain uh, uh, around uh, 119 complete genome sequence from dengue two genotype three. So we found the evidence of the circulation in 2018 on two distinct lineage that we call uh, BR three and BR4, and uh, the huge amount of genomic data that we obtained uh, for, uh, from the BR4 gave us the possibility again to identify two distinct clade and or lineages, which are the BR4 lineage one and the BR4 lineage two. Uh, so we saw that the uh, actually the outbreak 2019 uh, um, uh, was like the source of this outbreak uh, was mediated by the southeast region of Brazil. Um, then, uh, so those are really our uh, last results uh, from the characterization of West Nile. So actually, these are uh, those activities. Those activities have been realized during our Christmas uh, holidays. So we detect uh, West Nile virus in three horses in three Brazilian states, which are located in uh, Northeast Brazil in the states of Piauí, uh, and then in Southeast Brazil in the state of Sao Paulo as well as uh, Minas Gerais. And for the first time, we combine genomic uh, uh, and uh, epidemiological um, information to try to describe the initial step of the West Nile virus transmission uh, in Brazil. Uh, so what's next? Uh, so I know there is a, a lot of information, but actually we, of course, uh, we were also involved with the, in the SARS-CoV-2 pandemic. Uh, so we call the crisis of the time of coronaviruses. So actually, um, 
we were we were we had the opportunity to be part of this new phenomenal way to the science so we know that it actually in 13 months of the epidemic pandemic uh, we all were were able to generate this huge amount of genomic data so i think that Actually, during the SARS cov so for the first time, we had like uh, a great opportunity to collaborate as well as uh, to work together to try to fight uh, against uh, this kind of emerging viral uh, uh, pathogens. Uh, so, in this sense, what about our contribution to the pandemic? I was involved and in, I tried to follow the pandemic uh, and the epidemic uh, here in Brazil, uh, as well as in Italy. So, at the beginning, uh, by using the uh, comparative genomics as well as the homology modeling, we were able to describe that the bat SARS was the most related uh, to the SARS-CoV-2, as well as we uh, were able also using homo homology modeling uh, uh, analysis to identify some mutations that appear to be uh, like responsible the jump species that kind of mechanism that we use to call germ species. Uh, then we were also involved in collaboration also with the University of Florida uh, to try to describe uh, and to date back uh, the introduction events of this pathogen, of these new emerging vir uh, viruses worldwide that was dated back around October, November 2018. And then we were also involved, of course, to try to describe the Italian epidemic. So at the beginning, we tried to characterize the first two like imported cases from Chinese tourists uh, in Rome, uh, as well as uh, uh, we um, provide the evidence that, of course, the Italian epidemics uh, following the, the same path of other uh, country was the result of multiple independent introduction events. So we, we can say that human, as well as the globalization, uh, can mitigate, uh, in this sense, those kind of mechanisms and uh, um, can uh, give the opportunity to some uh, emerging virus to be able to circulate in place where, where they were circulating, actually. Um, and then we also try to characterize also the... Um, the uh, mutational pattern profile uh, of the valuable genomes. Uh, so we found, uh, we described the role of the NSP2 and SP3 in this pathogenesis, as well as in collaboration with the professor Robert Gall of the University of Maryland, we described uh, uh, mutational pattern which appear to be, uh, I can say like, uh, which appear to be associated with uh, country specific. So all of these uh, studies also were, uh, were really important to try to design a new and uh, uh, a dynamic uh, classification scheme, uh, which, holds, which nowadays is the pangolin lineage assignment tool uh, to try to describe uh, uh, the circulation, co-circulation of different lineages worldwide. Uh, and then we also describe the role of the protein NSP6 uh, uh, in uh, viral uh, autophagy. So here, and uh, really happy to show also this, uh, this work that actually we, uh, we were uh, performing the, with the professor Marcello as well. Uh, so it was, um, we tried to describe the Italian epidemic uh, since the first case is up to October 2020. So we described the first epidemic week and the second epidemic peak. So we tried to combine uh, genomic as well as um, epidemiological information to try to describe for the first time uh, the Italian epidemic uh, in wool. Uh, so we provide evidence of the circulation of multiple lineages. So uh, we need to we need also to, to know and to understand that actually the currently SARS-CoV-2 lineage assignment uh, is uh, really dynamic. I would like to say too much dynamic. So actually the pangolin tool is uh, updating like uh, day by day. So this is going to, to change again. I can say we have uh, too many uh, subclassification already due to the concept uh, to the respect of the new variants uh, that have been described uh, in Brazil as well as in South Africa as well as in UK. Uh, and here, uh, we, uh, we provide evidence, of course, uh, as I said, uh, that uh, multiple introduction events uh, may have been mediated in the Italian epidemic, and we provide evidence that some um, silent cluster really mediating and were responsible of the second epidemic peak after uh, our unlucky summer time. Um, 
uh, well, we were involved also as a said to the to follow the SARS-CoV-2 epidemic here in Brazil. So this is a part of our group. Uh, so we characterized the first complete genome sequence from SARS-CoV-2 uh, from likely imported cases in Minas Gerais states. We provide the first preliminary overview of the uh, SARS-CoV-2 epidemic uh, in three uh, Brazilian states, which are Sao Paulo, Rio de Janeiro, and Minas Gerais, located in Southeast. Uh, despite those activities, we were also involved to try to uh, develop some uh, bioinformatics tools. So uh, among them, I would like to show you the Genome Detective One, which is like a huge collaboration among uh, uh, Brazilian, South African, as well as uh, Belgian uh, scientists. Uh, so Genome Detective actually gave the possibility to um, uh, do the assembly uh, in real time, so in a short period of time, actually, and uh, it gave the possibility to realize they are simply using several platforms, uh, Minion, uh, Illumina, PGM, and uh, whatever. So um, inside the, uh, the Genome Detective, we can also uh, find some uh, subtyping tool. Um, the majority of them are specific for agroviruses, which that is actually the main focus of, of our work. But of course, we expand these also to the coronavirus typing tool to the SARS, due to the SARS-CoV-2, uh, of course, uh, pandemic. Uh, I really also happy to say that I was involved with actually in March 2020. Uh, I had the huge pleasure to be in, uh, in Darwin in the CRIS platform uh, lead by the professor Tullio Oliveira, which is uh, our huge collaborator. So I'm really proud to say that actually I, I participated to the setup of the lab. So we were uh, uh, like make everything ready to receive the first SARS-CoV-2 uh, genomes. Uh, and this is uh, our first preliminary overview of the South African SARS-CoV-2 pandemic. So we described the circulation, co-circulation 16 of the lineages, and more recently also we described uh, the new variants, uh, which, um, which um, also have uh, and present some uh, mutation uh, in the receptor bound in the main, uh, which is of course of international concern due to the possibility to escape against neutralized antibody and this is of course a really uh, challenging in the vaccine era that we are living. Um, just uh, just as um, like the uh, final uh, a final thing that I want to show to you, uh, we know I was also involved here in Salvador to try to characterize some reinfection cases. So we know that there is actually a growing evidence of SARS-CoV-2 reinfection cases. So I think that in this moment, one main objective is like try to understand and try to discover if actually we will have uh, protection and the reinfection in uh, COVID nineteen. So there is actually a growing evidence uh, that people uh, that are recovering from uh, SARS-CoV-2 can be able like, to be reinfected again. So also this uh, uh, may be mediated by the presence of several uh, SARS-CoV-2 variants. Right. Uh, well, uh, in this sense, we know that to be able to confirm a possible fast COVID or infection, we need to meet some uh, several criteria. Uh, most of, mm, some of them are epidemiological ones, including, for example, the period of time uh, during which the case is not present with symptoms of primary infection by SARS CoV 2 uh, that need to be around 90 days. And of course, for example, the presence of a negative laboratory test for SARS CoV 2. And then uh, some other are uh, laboratory criteria. So, for example, the complete genome sequence of SARS-CoV-2 for primary and second infection indicated they belong to different genetic clades and or lineages regardless of the number of single nucleotide variations. So we expect the virus to mutate by approximately two weeks per month. Uh, so those are the results from our uh, characterization of the first uh, SARS-CoV-2 uh, reinfection case uh, that carry on the E4E4 key spike mutation in Brazil uh, that have uh, today be accepted in uh, Emerging Infection Disease Journal. Uh, so we we know that actually evolution and fever infection, and we know that uh, um, so here we have just described the case of a 35 years old female 
colleague. She she is a health work uh, executive. She used to work in the San Rafael Hospital, which is located in Bahia States, in the capital city of Salvador. So um, she reported the. Uh, um, uh, symptoms of first infection in May 26, 2020, and also she presented a second episode uh, October 26, uh, 2020. So uh, we use uh, the Alplex and Multiplex PCR scheme uh, for targeting three genes for SARS-CoV-2, which are the IN, E, and the RDRP genes. Uh, and we found a city values of uh, 25, 26, and 27 during the first infection and the city values of uh, 21, 12 uh, and 17 uh, during the second in infection that occurred actually 147 days later the first event. So four weeks after uh, the second episode, the, uh, she also presented a positive EGG result by chemiluminescence with an index value of 2.15. Uh, so then we decided to characterize the complete genome sequence from the first and the second episode uh, using the PGM ion torrent uh, technology. And we obtained uh, uh, the two complete genome sequence from the first and the second episode with a mean coverage of 99%. Uh, so uh, we then to try to um, investigate the possible different viral origin of those two episodes, uh, and to do so, we use, of course, phylogenetic uh, inference. So to do so, we combine our new um, isolates, our two new isolates with all Brazilian SARS-CoV-2 strains already available on GSAID up to uh, January 15. So we found the evidence that the first uh, episode, uh, in the first episode, uh, the SARS-CoV-2 belonged to the B.1.1.33 lineage. In the second episode, we found evidence of the P2 lineage, which is also one new variant of international concern recently detected in Southeast Brazil. Um, so we start to be a really a bit worried and uh, we were really concerning about the, the detection of this pitual lineage, also considering that the second episode was a, a bit more severe. So in this, in the, this is why we try to characterize also the mutational pattern among the first and the second episode. And we found the evidence also of the E4E4 key mutation in the receptor binding domain. So all of this, of course, leads some uh, questions that need to be addressed already regarding the possibility, for example, to escape against neutralizing antibodies. So this will be really challenging in the vaccine era, as well as, uh, for example, uh, the potential role of this mutation also in uh, differential clinical outcomes, as well as, of course, in your infection. So uh, what... What we have learned actually in 12 months, uh, mutation in the viral genome happen all the time. Uh, and they are, uh, I can say, like an escape mechanism against the uh, immune response of the host. And we know this. All the no important variants are actually uh, nowadays in the spike protein. Uh, and with spike mRNA vaccines, uh, the immune response is ready toward the spike protein. We know this as well. And actually, this may happen randomly, but it is potentially enabled by the spacing out of the two doses of the vaccine, as it may give uh, the virus more opportunity to escape. So, um, uh, actually, uh, we know that all of this is, of course, of international concern in, in this moment due to the emergence and the circulation and co-circulation of the uh, SARS-CoV-2 variants, uh, which are nowadays really of international concern. So actually here in Brazil, we, among the variants, I just uh, here highlight the ones that are, uh, of course, of international concern, the B1.1.7, that is the UK one, the one, the South African one, that we characterize uh, in middle December 2020. And then uh, the, two, uh, the two Brazilian one, which are the P1 and the P2. The P1 is, of course, of international concern, much more than the P2. Uh, and the P1 uh, uh, was characterized for the first time uh, in North Brazil, but have been already detected in Southeast uh, and uh, Northeast region. Highlighting, uh, of course, the importance also to realize these uh, uh, genomic surveillance activity, activities as well as the genomic monitoring in order to try to uh, mitigate uh, the, the dispersion dynamics of these new variants. 
Uh, so I think that uh, actually, uh, just as a final remark, I would like to say that a global pandemic requires a global effort to end it. So really, we need to think that none of us will be safe until really everyone is safe. So I, that's all from my side. Thank you.